first and foremost, we are hoping to ask you to talk a little bit about your experiences at the Capitol on January 6th. And this is sure. de definitely in the mode of uh, collecting the history that's happening now. Talk to us a sure. little bit about your experiences on the 6th. Well, um, I had um, flown down um, and gone over to get my uh, vaccination actually on the house side. And then I uh, walked back over from there to the Senate side and checked in briefly on the floor to see what was happening. Um, and then I went up to what's called my hideaway office. Senators get a little one room office in the Capitol building. And I've now been around the Senate long enough that I have one with a window. It's up on the third floor and it looks out on the big parking lot between the Capitol and the Supreme Court and the uh, Library of Congress. And it's a common place where you see, um, pro you know, protest activity. And you could see out beyond the uh, fencing, which was just um, lovable fencing that looks like a uh, bicycle rack. In fact, they call it bicycle rack fencing. Um, you could see crowds, not particularly big crowds, um, and you could hear chanting and shouting and cheering and see the uh, Confederate flags and the Trump flags and the other flags um, all waving. And it actually seemed fairly calm. There were police officers posted maybe every 12 to 15 feet apart back behind the uh, fencing and people were honoring the uh, the fence line. And then I heard a very loud roar of noise and um, saw from left to right a wave of people rushing across the parking lot. Um, they had clearly breached the bicycle rack fencing to my left where I couldn't see and were now pouring into the field of vision of my window and rushing towards the center of the Capitol. Um, and at that point, I, um, they began to gather on the main Capitol steps and there was cheering and you could hear the megaphones uh, that some of them had. Um, a lot of them were the three syllable cheers, um, you know, stop the steal, um, that kind of stuff. Um, but there were also just some yelling over the megaphones. Um, it was kind of a racket. And then there were some very loud bangs. I think people might have had uh, fireworks that they were setting off. And then there was a lot of banging at the doors. I assumed at that point that the officers and the Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police were going to fall back to the Capitol building and that the Capitol building would be defensible and that that was going to be the end of it, that you know they'd clear them back after they'd had their chance to do their thing on the Capitol steps. Um, but as it turned out, the um, Capitol was breached shortly uh, thereafter. The first I heard of it was when I, uh, the door, uh, there was a knock on my door and um, the voice said, Capitol Police. So I opened the door and there was a very shaken um, African-American woman in a white shirted Capitol Police uniform, which I think means on the administrative staff of the Capitol Police. Um, and they asked if they could shelter her in my office. And so I said, of course, and sat her down in one of the chairs in my office and we talked for a little bit. I asked her her name, I offered her some water and tried to just have a calming conversation uh, with her. Um, and a few minutes later, they, there was another knock uh, on the door and uh, another white shirted Capitol Police officer, another female officer came in. Um, and I think her task was to, she'd been brought to keep an eye on and help her colleague. Um, and it was in their conversation that I realized that the Capitol had been breached. Um, I forget who said it first, but one of them said they're in the, or they're in the building or did, we kept them, 
something about them being in the building. Um, so then a moment later, a group of Capitol Police were back at the door again, and they said, um, sir, the Senate has been evacuated. You have to come with us now. We are evacuating all of the senators. And I said, well, how about these ladies? And they said, well, we've got a team coming for them, but you need to go now. So I grabbed my coat and I grabbed my iPad and I grabbed my iPhone and we started walking down the hallway and there was some loud banging uh, behind us and a lot of shouting. And they said, uh, sir, we think we need to pick it up here. And um, so we went into kind of a dog trot down the hallways from where my hideaway is to the main hallway outside of the Senate gallery. And in the main hallway outside of the Senate gallery, there were a mix of um, Senate security personnel, Capitol Police, Senate staff milling around, but there were enough of them that they were not going to, they were gonna be an obstacle to anybody who might've been following us. So at that point, we uh, slowed down to a walk and then went down to um, the basement through a series of stairwells. And from there walked along the um, tunnels that have the um, trolleys running through them to the location where the secure room would, had been set up for the senators and the parliamentary staff and the Senate floor staff and all. Um, along the way, um, I heard the radios of the police officers who were escorting me report that there were gunshots um, in the house chamber. Um, and I didn't know exactly what that was, but obviously that's not a good thing at all. Um, so that was um, disturbing to hear. And then we walked past a disabled male um, Capitol Police officer who it appeared had been bear sprayed. And he was having trouble with his breathing and, um, you know, dealing with the pepper spray consequences on his eyes and, you know, in his mouth and nose and all of that. And um, there was somebody with him and they said, we've got, you know, assistance coming. So we kept on uh, going. And then I, <laughs> I passed a little knot of people um, who were walking very slowly. I thought originally it was a very elderly congressman walking along with his staff who'd gotten like onto the wrong side of the Capitol and was on our side. But as I got closer, I realized, oh my gosh, that's our sergeant at arms. And it must've been his, some of his staff who were uh, with him. They uh, were not walking at any kind of a brisk pace. They didn't seem to be on the phone to anybody. I didn't quite know what they were doing, but it was a little bit distressing to see the person who presumably is in charge of defending the Senate, not at a command post, not, at, not seemingly engaged in any you know, immediate ongoing um, command role. So we went by him and then on to the um, location where we had been secured, where uh, now Chairman Leahy, Pat Leahy, who's the pro president pro tem and um, a very good photographer, uh, showed me a picture that somebody emailed him of somebody sitting in the presiding officer's chair in the Senate. And um, Leahy was really furious about that and really hurt. I mean, he's, the, he's been there for 40 years now and he loves the institution. And the idea that a mob would have put a uh, derelict like that in the chair of the Senate and um, I think was, he felt pretty deeply uh, about. Um, and there are Senate staffers who work for us who aren't on any partisan side. They just keep the operation moving and they take care of the institution and take care of the facilities and one of them was sitting in a place where she was rather solitary. And um, I walked uh, past her or towards her and I saw that she was weeping. And I went over to see what you know, comfort I might be able to provide or reassurance or just you know, wish her well. And she showed me the same picture. So she had been just, she, she saw the same picture and was just sobbing about what it had done to the institution that she has dedicated her career to serving. Um, we stayed more or less in place. I left for a while to go and make sure that a staffer who was in my uh, office 
my main office um, in the Senate Hart building. I walked over to that office to make sure that he was okay and was all set and you know had a plan for when he was gonna get out and the, the Capitol Police knew he was there, all of that. Uh, there had been no breach of the Hart building at that point. So our offices appeared to be secure, um, but I checked in with the staff person and then I came back and um, the one thing that stood out there was um, the parliamentary staff had with them these beautiful boxes with uh, leather strapping around them. They were really very beautifully made and you know polished and they looked like the case for something very fancy. And what they were uh, were the cases for the ballots. And in the mad rush to get out of the Senate as the mob flung itself at the Senate chamber, um, the parliamentary staff thought to make sure that they had those boxes with them and they had brought them and they were in the middle of the room um, being protected by the parliamentary staff and some of the Senate security people. But it struck me that they had the presence of mind to do that. Um, anyway, at some point, we uh, were escorted back into the chamber um, by then very serious looking SWAT teams that arrived, uh, people with full combat gear with, you know, the headlights on the on the helmets with, um, you know, automatic weapons. And um, there was just a lot of very, very um, high security presence at that point, uh, guiding us back to the Senate chamber and we re-entered the chamber. It was um, a wonderful feeling to be back in the chamber and to have determined that we were gonna do our business. That was the prevailing sense when we were together was by God, whatever we do, do not go home. Do not allow this to prevail. Um, if there's some risk, but it's manageable, let us get back there and let us get going. We need to send a really important message to the world that we have restored the function of the Senate, taken it back from the mob. So very strong bipartisan sentiment about that. And that was good. And then getting back onto the Senate floor was very good. Um, Senator Manchin, I remember from West Virginia had uh, wipes that he'd gotten from someplace and he was going around wiping around the desks. You know, we're still in a pandemic and who knows, none of them were wearing um, safety masks and they'd all been running around the Senate floor touching things so he was he was uh he was cleaning up and then we got to work and we went through uh, our business a lot of our colleagues decided not to pursue their opposition to the electoral ballots but a few insisted on pursuing it so we went through those motions um and each time they had support in the house they had to come back to the senate we had to vote and then they, the action would go back to the house again and the final one was pennsylvania and when we voted down the objection to the Pennsylvania ballots, that was it for us. And uh, we were all able to go home. So I gathered my uh, belongings. I went up to go check on my hideaway to see if that had been damaged or ransacked, it hadn't. Um, and I got a ride home because we happened to live in the same uh, building with Elizabeth Warren who had a police car set up to take her home. I think largely because of her, you know, fame and the, you know, she's a very, very known figure. So I got a ride home with her, and that was kind of the end of the, of the evening. Um, but I should note that after we went home, um, the house had to continue to do its business, and for several hours more, I think it was about two in the morning by the time we left. They were there, I think, till four. So for two more hours, there they were going through the process of running the electoral ballots and the people who were advising Vice President Pence as he stood at the rostrum in the house and went through that process were our same parliamentarians. So they'd come in very early that day to set up for all of this. They had been evacuated with all of us in the middle of the chaos. They had had to be protected from us, from us, with us, from the from the mob. They had thought, 
and had the presence of mind through all of that to make sure they kept the ballots would have been a disaster if they'd uh, left them behind. They'd come back, they had restarted the Senate and overseen our procedures as we closed out at two in the morning and they had um, stood side by side with Vice President Pence guiding him through all the procedures of tallying the remaining electoral votes. And then when that was done, they had come back to their offices now by probably five in the morning to find out that their offices had been destroyed and ransacked by the mob and that they had a massive cleanup to do, which you couldn't just send in a cleaning crews for because there was you know, papers that they may need to have kept um, and needed to be sorted, needed to be properly filed through all of it. So we had some real quiet heroes in uh, Elizabeth and Leah and some of the, and the parliamentary team who had as bad an experience as we did, um, had worse damage done to their offices, had to stay at work longer, and who were completely on the spot to make sure that it ran smoothly um, because they're the ones who are responsible for overseeing that, that process. So. Um, we've said a lot about the uh, courage uh, uh, as of the Capitol Police officers and how well they withstood that attack and what a brutal experience they all had and how dangerous and humiliating it was for Black members of the police uh, and of the staff who were um, treated very badly, repeatedly called the N-word by this white supremacist mob. Um, but in all of that, the uh, parliamentary staff have not had, as, I don't think, as much recognition as they deserve. So I, that's the thing I'd close with is by flagging um, what, how those women performed. Um, th this They'd one... actually been told not to. Oh, it's good that they don't... countermanded that. <laughs> You're, no, we're, we're evacuating you. You can't take any time to do this. We're, we're going right now. Oh. And they said, no, we're not. We're not, not without these boxes, we're not. Good for them. Yeah. So th this was incredibly uh, traumatic event for the country, those who watched and those who experienced it. And it really was in some ways or felt to be the culmination of a series of traumatic events in this country over the past year and more. Um, the pandemic, um, the recognition of uh, racial inequities and the unrest that that caused. Um, and now this, and all of these things are um, preventable, man-made traumas, not hurricanes or strikes by lightning. Um, and it seems that this moment could, as a result of all this, be a pivot point. Yeah. And so we're asking folks to think about, and I guess I'm asking you both as our Senator, but also as a, a human being, what should we do now? What should happen next? The thing that I keep coming back to is how much of what we have seen go wrong with our country has been propelled by lies, has been propelled by lies and by conspiracy theories um, and a lot of hate mongering and fear mongering that has stood on those lies and those conspiracy theories. Um, and it has not been spontaneous lying. This is not like, you know, your kid who gets caught, you know, eating a cookie and you can see the cookie crumbs and the chocolate still on his face. And you say, did you take a cookie out of the cookie jar? And he says, no, I didn't. <laughs> you know, with the cookie smeared all over his face. It wasn't that kind of, you know, spontaneous lie in response to a challenge. This was very deliberately created and supported and propagated. Um, and I think that's the thing we more than anything else have to reckon with. I think the appetite for lying and for accepting lies was dramatically expanded by the climate change fight and the way that the fossil fuel industry both spread lies about climate science 
and forced Republicans to accept those lies by just brute political pressure. People who didn't got punished, people who did got rewarded. And you took the bipartisanship on climate that happened really up until 2010 and Citizens United and the, having the weaponry to pull this off and then boom, <clears throat> just forcing that dishonest orthodoxy on one of our, our political parties. And then once that's in place, you know, kind of the guardrails are down for lying and other things began to come. And um, Trump is a phenomenal, liar and he doubles down with more lies when he's caught lying. He'll never admit that he's lying or wrong. So you had this kind of twofer of a president who propagated lies as a part of his messaging apparatus and as part of being disruptive and as part of how he riled up supporters. And you had this very, very insidious, very big political apparatus designed to spread lies around climate uh, denial. And those two things converge to a point where, you know, Fox just trafficked in lies all the time. And right wing radio and media trafficked in lies all the time. And we need to fight back. There's been some good fighting back in courts where the truth mm -hmm. has its way. Mm -hmm. So some of these liars have had to pay big settlements to the parents of the young DNC volunteer who they claimed had been murdered by Hillary Clinton. Um, to the, the families of the uh, Sandy Hook uh, children who were massacred um, and who right-wing outlets said, well, that was a fake, that was a hoax, that was uh, you know an inside job. The parents have received uh, judgments. And now you have these companies that were thrown into the middle of the big lie about the stolen election who are now suing uh, some of the mouthpieces who propagated those lies, and they're busily backtracking and, you know, trying to clean up their lying and get out of harm's way. But if it weren't for courts, you know, we've learned that we can't rely on the media to tell us the truth, at least not the right-wing media. And we've learned that we can't rely on politicians to tell us the truth, because this guy just, I mean, he lied on such an epic scale, he lied like he breathed. Um, and that we have not yet reckoned with the huge apparatus that has been built for the propagation of lies. So, you know, it's really hard to run a democracy if you don't have a common body of fact that you're operating off of. So this business of lying and of having lying become a wholesale industrial operation, um, I think is the thing we most have to reckon with. I really appreciate that. I, I distinctly agree that dealing with that shared set of facts and the truth is one thing we all need to be doing next. Thank yeah. you for that.